Um, given that we had the discussion about his statue just a couple of weeks ago on the show, I think it's safe to say that Robert Clive, a.k.a. Clive of India, is a pretty controversial figure. Um, he, he was it during his lifetime, and he still is now with the statue in the square in Shrewsbury. Sparking debate. A historian Dominic Selwood's new book is called Anatomy of a Nation, the History of British Identity in 50 Documents. And Robert Clive features in one of the chapters of that book. Dominic Selwood joins us um, this morning. Dominic, thank you so much for being with us. Um, Hello, this, good morning, Jim. Thank you for this, having me. This morning. Um, the yeah, the book is A History of British Identity in, in 50 Documents. Which which is document number 27, the one that applies to the chapter that Clive is in? Right. So that's a really fascinating document uh, because it's a key document in Clive's life, but also the life of uh, Britain and the creation of what would ultimately become the Raj. Because it's a letter from Clive to William Pitt, the Prime Minister, on what Clive saw as the opportunities in India. So he wrote this in 1759, and there was a a long background. Clive had just been successful uh, at the all-important Battle of Classy, and uh, effectively the emperor of India, the Mughal emperor, had said to Clive, do you, you, Clive, and the East India Company, want to take over running Bengal, which was the richest part of India at the time, one of the richest places in the world? And Clive realised that actually it was probably more than the East India Company could handle. So he asked Pitt whether, whether the British government wanted to take over. And Pitt was quite canny and said, no, actually, we don't want to, because Pitt was having um, power struggles with the king, George II, and didn't want all that money coming in, and therefore George feeling a bit more independent. So Pitt said, no, you, you get on with it. Um, and the result, of course, was that the East India Company, which was you know, a corporation, just like a modern company, but it had its own army, uh, which Clive was a, was a leading um, commander in, the East India Company took over running part of India. And that turned out to be, for the company, such a successful model. And for all the company's shareholders back in, back in the UK, many of whom were MPs, that, that, you know, within really not very long, the East India Company was running as a, as a governmental authority vast swathes of the subcontinent. I mean, it's never really happened before or since that a private company acts, acts with its own army, acts as a government. So that was the letter, really, that signalled the beginning of that. And as we know, that then eventually turned into the Raj as well when it all got so corrupt that, um, that the government nationalised the East India Company's interests in India. But that letter, really, is a key moment in the, in the history of, you know, of, of the British Empire, which is now, of course, so controversial. What led the what led the mogul to say to Clive, um, okay, you and your private army have just pitched up here. Would you like to run the richest part of our, kind of our country? Because <laughs> it's it's the it. I, I just I'm just wondering why he would have done that. Um, Clive had been successful at the Battle of Plassey, where he was he was massively outnumbered. Um, by, by, you know, factors of 10. So there were 50,000 troops under the local uh, Indian ruler, and Clive had 3,000. But he managed to convince uh, an important part of, the, uh, uh, of his opponent's army to, to defect at the uh, kind of critical stage of the battle. Um, and, so, and so Clive won, and then he consolidated that win a couple of years later at the Battle of Buxar. And really, the, um, the emperor had no choice. He was aware that, that, that Calcutta and Bengal were completely under the control of the East India Company, who'd put in a puppet ruler. Um, so really, it was, it was an acknowledgement of reality rather than a magnanimous gift that came out of nowhere. I, oh, right. I, thank you for clearing that up, because I was... Uh, I was <laughs> it, it, it does sound as if... It did sound a bit different to the kind of the, 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 the way, way we picture this. So Clive wrote to the Prime Minister saying, um, do you want India, yes or no? Um, and how was that received? You already mentioned that it was the Prime Minister versus the King at the time. Uh, how was that received back in, in, back in the UK, back in England? Um, were, did people think... Um, what on earth is this rapacious individual doing trying to take over a country several times the size of ours? Or was it, well, oh, OK, fine, he's doing all right? Mixed is the answer. Um, m- many MPs had shares in the East India Company, and so, and so did a lot of leading people in the country. And, of course, they stood to profit from, from the East India Company's advances. And this was a very, very significant advance. To that date, really, the company had been trading with, with India and Southeast Asia and China and running its opium factories 
uh, you know, and make and making an awful lot of money. But suddenly, this is on a different level because they'd be allowed to tax the people of Bengal and and reap a lot of the, the you know the wealth and the riches of of, of Bengal. Um, so it was a mixture. There were there were those who were very much in favour of of the company doing this, um, and it was at no real cost to the British taxpayer because the company was a private corporation and privately funded. But there were also those who were very critical. And you know, as we look at this now through the more modern lens. And we think about criticisms of empire. You know, some people think that that actually Clive was loved in his day, and we've only you know more recently come to uh, dislike him. That's absolutely not the case. There were lots of critics at the time. Uh, you know, he he was he was known as a vulture. He was known as the tyrant of Madras. Um, he faced a lot of criticism in his day, and and eventually, at the age of forty nine, he was sitting in his Belgravia uh, 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 Mayfair. Um, a Barclay Square flat, he, he killed himself either with an opium overdose or with a penknife to his throat. I mean, he, he tried to kill himself uh, earlier in his life when he was when he was a young man when he first arrived in India because he was bored and very unhappy. Um, you know, he, he had a lot of demons and he had darkness, but he in his lifetime he became fundamentally unpopular. And it was um, suggested, and, and, and it was was suggested that. That, 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 that that suicide was because he couldn't live with the things that he'd done. Do you think that's, do you think that's right? I mean, we don't know. He didn't. He didn't leave a suicide note. Uh, we do know that he was always a troubled person, and that, and that uh, you know, uh, self self harm and violence to others was part of his life. Um, and I think he'd he'd come back. He was done. He'd suffered from ill health throughout his entire life as well. Um, so I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a psychiatrist, but it does sound like he was he was a troubled individual who pretty much come to the end of the road. The um, Clive of India is, um, he, he, as, as we've been saying, still still divides opinion. Um, did your research for uh, this book? What what light did your research shed on his on his character and whether he was more complex than he's been painted? Definitely a complex character. Um, came from came from not privileged uh, background. Um, it had a difficult schooling. Uh, his um, his reports mainly were that he just enjoyed acts of daring and getting into trouble fighting. His father didn't really know what to do with him, so sent him off to Fort St. George in, in Madras, now Chennai, to go and work for the company. Um, and as I say, when he got there, he, he, he soon tried to kill himself because he was so bored and unhappy. But then he, um, when, the, when the French... Uh, started some military activities there. He got involved in doing some fortifications and 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 running some um, you know military engagements, and found that he absolutely loved it and was really good at it. Um, and so transferred to the company's army division, uh, military wing, and uh, and then w- was promoted very quickly. But but he he had um, a deep sense of intrigue and was a very astute political manoeuvrer. As we saw at the Battle of Plassey, where he was able to, you know, have, have pre-orchestrated that a key part of, of, um, of the Mughal army, um, uh, you know, defected. He loved this backroom stuff and he, and he knew India well. You know, in total, he spent 30 years there and he knew the people and he, he saw the, you know, part, part of that opportunity in writing to Pitt was saying the opportunity is actually that the emperor is losing his grip. And, and India is fragmenting, and the right people here could really could really benefit from that, could break it apart, and could um, do that to their own advantage. And you know, he thought that was a job for a state, but actually, it was pushed back on him as the company. So, I think he was a complex person. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there are all sorts of um, deeply horrific things about his life and his activities, not least the Bengal famine. Um, so, you know, I think criticism of him at the time and now is, is absolutely valid. Um, but he, he, he's not a one-sided person at all. He's not, he's not black and white. Dominic, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I could talk to you for equally as long about every single one of those documents in that book. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at number 27. Uh, Dominic Selwood's new book is, is called Anatomy of a Nation, A History of British Identity in 50 Documents. Chapter 27 uh, looks closely at um, Shropshire's own, even if you may not want him, Clive of India. Uh, Dominic Selwood, thanks for being with us.